Okay, so what I wanted to do this morning was show you a couple of little examples. So in this box right here, I have what I'm going to be speaking about today in the way of soil crust. First thing I want to do is try to demonstrate visually for you, which you can't see very well from where you are, but I'm going to try and fix that. I'm also going to pass this around the audience. But the first thing I'm going to do is just prove to you exactly how dry this stuff is. Now this is a sample of soil crust that was harvested just over the Prime Ridge outside of Twin Falls last evening before it rained. Now I'm going to take it, I'm going to just do this, smooth it around, and it's all gone, right? Really dry stuff. Now I'm going to take a little bigger chunk of it, I'm going to break it into two pieces for your viewing pleasure. We're gonna try a little experiment while I'm talking, if I'm lucky. And I don't know if it's gonna come through or not. One side should come out green by the end of my talk, and we're gonna be able to see that happen. And one side is going to stay brown and brown. But in case it doesn't work on screen, it will work in your hands. And so I'm gonna pass this around, one that's been wetted and one that has not. So you can see it in real time. Now, this stuff will regenerate. I'm gonna have a little assistant help me out here. Thanks, sir. Been helping a lot this morning, more than you thought originally. Um, you guys, so this is tactile stuff. So as it's coming through the audience, I'd really like you to actually touch it, feel it. Take a look at it, it's a little dark, but you'll be able to see that the side that's wet is just went from black and nothing to brown, or excuse me, from black and nothing to brown through green. And it's actually gonna actually send out fruiting bodies before the end of my talk. All right, so biological soil crust, what is it? We all, uh, we all think about it, it's the earth's skin, right? It's the thing that keeps everything above ground from touching everything below ground. It has a lot of fun inclusions. Why do we need it? All those things that biological soil crust does for the environment, is why we need it. It's a very unique organism. It's actually a set of organisms that function well together. What do they do? They produce plant available nitrogen more of it in arid systems than any other source, which might be contrary to what you had previously been taught or told. How do we get it? Well, historically, the only way we've been able to get soil crust is to actually let it happen on its own account. We didn't really understand it. We walked past it a lot. And when we walked past it, we, uh, we crushed it, smeared it out, you saw how fragile it is. Uh, and so inside of that, it's a very difficult thing to even consider as its own living, breathing organism or set of organisms. All right. So the problem, why is soil crust important in this context? Well, there's a lot of reasons it's important, but with specific regard to the planet, it's important because we're losing our topsoil roughly 10 times faster then we're able to get it back. Where do you think that topsoil is going? It's going into the ocean, right? It's going into our rivers, our streams, our lakes, the ocean. It's going away. It's going away for a lot of reasons, a whole lot of reasons. But I'm gonna talk about a few that are really impactful locally here in Idaho. So this slide or picture is a, is a photo of uh, desertification where again, there have been a lot of surface disturbances over a long period of time to an arid landscape. All right, things like grazing or perhaps uh, development of some sort, right? Twin Falls is a town. It was built in the middle of a cold desert. Here we sit. We had to disturb a lot of ground to make Twin Falls. We don't have a lot of soil crust back in underneath this building. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, so this is a challenge, trying to get this stuff back in a situation like this. The standard run for recruitment in arid systems around the world for soil crust, the acceptable technology up until we developed ours, was a 125-year recruitment cycle. And that's pretty big. It takes a long time for soil crust to come back if you take it out. 
and you saw how easy it was. Now, this one's near and dear to us. Here in Idaho, we see an awful lot of burns, fire in rangeland. Fire is a disturbance that causes a lot of problem. It's also merely a symptom. Fire isn't the problem, it's a symptom of the problem. The problem is this disturbance, so everything kind of builds on itself here. Once you have a disturbance and you take away that stability in the landscape, you create other issues. Soil trust helps soften those problems. That's why it's important to come back to it again and again. Fire is perpetuated by cheatgrass. Cheatgrass is, a, is an invasive species of plant, vascular plant, that takes over once soil crust is removed. Specifically, cheatgrass has no mechanical mechanism to break soil crust for its seed to viably grow through it. Thus, where you have soil crust intact, okay, you don't have cheatgrass. If you don't have cheatgrass, you don't have this very repetitive, short, uh, or very frequent fire regime. All right, and then finally, Last but not least, uh, this is a photo of an ag field uh, that's just being windblown. And in agriculture, what I want you to think about, there are a couple of neat things about soil crust in agriculture. And so much as disturbance, it's pretty obvious. We work until the soil make it viable for annual crops that we grow. And those crops are all driven by, you know, an annual production cycle. That's very, very important, very, very short, very, very fast. Soil crust take 125 years to recruit, not really a good mix with traditional ag systems, right? And we have a lot of traditional ag systems in what used to be deserts. Now, we can also talk about water, water use, water conservation, water saving, carbon sink. Uh, all these things are, are issues and bits and bobs that have been passed and talked around for quite a while now, and so they're becoming comfortable topics for people to talk about. Again, soil crust mitigates some of those issues. It retains water, it creates nitrogen, it holds soil in place. The research that's been done with regard to soil crust, when you look at a wind-blown system like this, hurricane force winds and wind tunnels in the sagebrush step have been set up. So they take a little tent, they dome it all out, they put a big giant fan on one end and they fire that thing off, and how much soil do you think is removed on the other end? If there's an established soil crust. Almost none. Literally walking through the space that's covered with the tent creates enough disturbance to see a complete loss of the A horizon or the top horizon in the soil below that soil crust. By the way, when I talk about soil crust as an entity and thing, five millimeters in thickness is all we're talking about that saves it or loses it. Five millimeters of a mix of living organisms. All right, so the need. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit, broad scale and scope. Soil crust is a mix of organisms, does need stuff out there, holds soil in place, retains water, helps vascular plants grow. How big an issue is it? 450 million acres in the United States. Think about that for a minute. 450 million surface acres of arid landscapes that are dominated by this feature. Really dominated by this feature. Now we're always tied to charismatic uh, megaflora above the ground. Things like sagebrush, and flowers, and trees, but guess what? Without that earth skin, without that soil crust in place, the flowers, the sagebrush, and the trees all have challenges with the soil chemistry below the crust. So we have to have it all together. With regard to restoration practices, we've been walking past it for decades. We just walked right past it. We were focusing on all the soil chemistry below the ground. We were focusing on how to grow plants above ground. It was really fun stuff. But we were missing it. We weren't being very successful. And at the end of the day, as a scientist and somebody that really cares about native restorations, I wanted to be successful. When I planted a seed, I wanted to see it grow. We were missing a piece. 
This is one of the pieces we were missing, soil crust, and it wasn't really well understood. We're getting there. Now, we've talked about how impactful it is locally. Let's talk about how impactful it is globally. 4.5 billion acres of arid land, the Mongolian steppe, a good portion of India, China, all of the Middle East. Think about it, Afghanistan, Iraq. Do you think they have some disturbances over there that might be perturbing their soil crust? <laughs> I think they do. All right, the challenge. So now we've kind of moved through this whole process. We know that we know that's cool stuff. We know it does good things for us. We know we want it. What we had to figure out, and what we ultimately did figure out, was how to collect it, harvest it locally, regionally, grow it out, propagate it in such a way that we could get enough volume of specific components that we really needed to get out there in the initial onset and get them re-delivered to the landscape in a live format that would actually survive. That was the hitch. That was the hardest part. Collecting it, not so bad. We could find remnant traces of this stuff. We could get it collected. Growing it out, look, it's microbes. That's what we were working with. We were uniquely interested in this character. And this guy is microcolius. That's a blue-green algae. We're all familiar with blue-green algae. It's a very specific kind. It produces this little layer here. It's a viscous sheath. That viscous sheath, that sticky tacky sheath that it makes, it grows so prolifically that that's what holds the soil in place. You can imagine if we could have enough of it, we could put it out there. Now this guy works in conjunction with several other organisms that we identified and isolated, figured out how to grow and propagate. And then the big challenge happens, right? So we get this far down the trail. This was, that took us about seven years, believe it or not, to get that far. Then we wanted to re-deliver it. We wanted to get it back out there. Congratulations, guys. You, you've done a good job. You, you figured it out. Now you can grow it. We went to put it back out, and we killed everything. And that was a bummer, because that wasn't our goal. <laughs> so we didn't want to kill everything. We wanted it all to make it. So it took us another three years to figure out how to actually get it delivered to the soil service in such a way that it would live when it hit. And when we did that, our recruitment time frame, you'll recall the historic time frame and the, and the accepted scientific time frame for recruitment of soil crusts and natural systems that are disturbed is 125 years, 17 days. Now we've got an impact, right? Pretty cool stuff. Um, it was exciting in a big way. All right, this slide is really complicated, this part of this picture in the slide. I put that in there mostly to confuse you. No, that's not true. I put this in here just so you can understand that there's actually a lot going on, and I'm really just touching the surface of it today. This guy uh, over here, and some of you might have trouble seeing it because of that projector, but this fellow here is our delivery system. It looks like a spray truck, right? I can assure you there's a lot of things happening there that make it something other than a spray truck. <laughs> and this is moss. By the way, what's going around the room in a little tub is this component, right? This is a late seral condition. This is the pine tree of soil crust. Everything in the world, by the way, wants to be a pine tree before it, it's done. All the landscapes that you know, they want to turn into some sort of coniferous tree or evergreen tree. That's just where they want to end up. Uh, the same thing is true for soil. Every mountain you've ever met wants to find itself in an ocean. That's just a natural process, right? We kind of need them to stay in place, though. And we really enjoy some of the fun bits that grow up on them and around them. All right, so I talked a little bit about cost versus time. Previously, what I'm, I'll move through this quickly. The, the bottom line is, historically, to set things up, in restoration to be successful costs roughly $1,400 an acre. With a new technology like soil crust, we can reduce that to $500 an acre. That's pretty profound savings when you're talking about 
450 million acres. Wow. You think there's a marketplace? The bottom line is fire impacts in the western United States between 9 and 15 million acres annually. And the federal government, who's in charge of most of those acres, is mandated to restore it. The challenge is getting it done right the first time. We cannot continue to employ dated technology that doesn't facilitate a happy ending with regard to successful restoration and happy vascular plant growth on the surface. There's too many people that count on that. Ranchers, right? Recreationists, water quality, all these things at large depend on these larger concepts and functional systems. Cost is important because at the end of the day, if it costs too much, we don't do it. If you're going to spend the money, wouldn't you like to know that the money's being spent in such a way that it's successful? We thought that was a good idea. So local and regional. Um, I had mentioned that the, the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, or the Department of Interior, is in charge of the lion's share of what I would consider to be uh, the most impactful space that's disturbed and needs restoration. And when I say that, I mean it in, implicitly in vascular plant restoration. All right, Idaho Transportation Department uses a lot of it as well. Uh, I'll close by saying that when you're out there, look under your feet. There's some really unique and fun things happening, but they're important. Don't bust a crust. All right, thank you.